A handless corpse is washed up on a remote beach. Investigators have little to go on. Who is he? Where has he come from? And who has murdered him so brutally? In this case, the science of pathology provides the investigation with crucial data. A segment of skin proves to be key as science unravels the macabre story of Operation Red Rocks. A crime scene is a puzzle that has to be solved. A whodunit, a scattering of clues to be deciphered by clever detective work and the power of science. Red Rocks is on the south coast of Wellington. It's a pretty windswept, barren beach, frequented by locals out walking their dogs or having a look at the seal colony that's sometimes around there. But generally, not many people are around there. About eight o'clock, a person was out walking their dog and found what they thought was a body on the beach. However, because of the fact that the body had some missing limbs, wasn't quite sure, so rung the police. At that point, we weren't sure what the tides were doing, but given the waves seemed to be coming in closer and closer to the bank and actually picking the body up and moving it, uh, we felt that the tide was probably coming in. We made a decision, well, we're actually going to need to go into the water, retrieve the body and bring it up to, you know, beyond the, the high tide mark and two of us went into the water. When I went to grab the body, it was the first time I actually noticed that the ankles had been bound together uh, using some sort of type of tape. The body was dismembered, the head almost separated, and the hands completely severed. It was incredibly surreal, and here we were looking at quite a macabre um, scene. It's very rare to find bodies in New Zealand with hands or other limbs missing in circumstances like this. So it was pretty obvious that it was a homicide. The search began for clues as to who the victim was and where he had come from. We had to search the length of the beach and on the other side of the road. That took a lot of staff, and that became quite a detailed crime scene examination where we used the expertise of the specialist search group who were able to come in and basically grid off an area, and they searched pebble by pebble. Working fastidiously to salvage what they could before the tide turned. It was an unidentified body and nobody knew why or by whom, so everything could be important. You've got no idea what's potentially relevant or what's not. I remember standing there looking at the staff who were on the beach doing this crime scene examination, thinking, wow, what are they actually going to find on this barren beach? After an initial wide sweep, investigators focused in on four separate scenes. There was where the body had been located. There was where a tarpaulin was located on the beach. There was the area of water where the wharf police had found another tarpaulin. The police had found what looked like car marks in the stones. We found almost some quite deep depressions as if somebody had been wheel spinning. We found cigarette butts near those car marks. Red Rocks Beach is made up of lots of really fine, tiny pebbles, so you do sink into that quite quickly, and part of the scene examination found a very, very distinct drag mark from the location of where a vehicle had been stuck right down into the water. We found blood on some of the stones in the, this, what looked like a trail. Finding the blood on some of the dry stones above the high water mark and then blood on the tarpaulin a bit further down and indications that a car had been there. It's a bit more than just coincidental, you know, when you've got an unidentified body with the hands cut off. All potential evidence is tagged and bagged for further processing. As officers continue work on the beach, a post-mortem is already underway. 
I'm meeting with pathologist Simon Stables to discuss what he can determine from the autopsy. Were there any observations that gave you an insight into what may have happened? Uh, I think so. Just looking at the sequence of the injuries, he had evidence of several blows to the back of the head, one relatively high up and one sort of slightly low down. There was a small laceration just under the chin and he also had an abrasion on his forehead. And that pattern of those injuries suggests to me that he's hit face first on the ground. What I think has happened is he's had one blow to the relatively the top of the head, he's then gone forward, another blow to the back of the head, and then he's fallen to the ground, and it's at that stage he then has further blows to the head. He has then survived for a period of time because fluid has accumulated in the chest, and fluid can accumulate in the chest after a person's had a head injury. If he had died immediately of his head injuries, that fluid wouldn't have accumulated. He also had a large cut to the left and the front of the neck, the carotid artery and the jugular vein, they were cut. And that was actually the fatal injury. We needed to identify who the victim actually was. So that was our primary focus at that stage. Obviously from the start, we had to consider that was the purpose of the limbs being missing, was actually to prevent identification. The only items of clothing uh, that he had on him were a pair of shoes and a pair of unbranded black socks, and we had a pair of cotton trousers. But the real item of value to us of significance was this black leather Dunhill branded belt, which, unlike the rest of the clothing, was quite unique. The clothing is photographed and released to the public in the hope that someone would be able to identify the wearer. The tape that bound the ankles is removed and examined. Often you can get in between the layers of the sellotape, so as the sellotape's been wrapped around an item, you can sometimes get DNA or fingerprints contained within that. So even though we have a body that's been in the water for perhaps at least 24, 48 hours, there's still a possibility that we may find evidence within the layers of that tape. Evidence that could identify the victim or his killer. The tape is fumigated with superglue to show up any latent fingerprints. We use superglue fumes which wrap with moisture in fingerprints. And then we put a dye on that. Once the dye is fixed, it is washed off, and then a fluorescent light is used to expose any potential prints. But unfortunately, in this case, um, no fingerprints were developed on that tape leaving no clues as to who had bound the victim. Investigators make inquiries in the direct vicinity of where the body was discovered. We located a number of residents who had been round at batches further round past the crime scene, and some of those residents told us about an event that had happened on the Saturday night where they had located a car, a blue Saparu, that had been stuck in sand. Initially they were you know, sort of chuckling at here was a person who was foolish enough to bring a vehicle down on, into the Red Rocks beach. So they actually helped him get out of the beach, towed him out, and uh, he carried on his way. So here we had a sighting of a blue Subaru the night before we find the body on the beach stuck. So we're going, well, that's interesting. Could be relevant, could be completely irrelevant. And if it is relevant, had the helpful locals just unwittingly assisted the killer in getting away? Investigators believe the hands were removed from the body washed up on Red Rocks Beach to avert identification. A post-mortem provides a cause of death, a sequence of injuries, and one other important detail. Even though both hands had been removed, he still had a small amount of his palm skin left on his right wrist. The hand had been removed roughly at this level. There was another chop there and another one slightly further back. And curving around the side here was a little flap of skin. Present at the autopsy were two fingerprint officers, and I suggested that this may be sufficient to identify him. Identifying an individual from a palm isn't as unusual as it sounds, as fingerprint officer Brent Stinson explains. 
our palms and our hands and our fingertips and the length of our fingers is all made up of the same uh, ridge skin and it's all unique and identifiable to each person. Okay, so I'm going to figure just to grab this vase, I can demonstrate how we can take a palm print off that. Thank you. Thanks. And are there some places you're more likely to get a palm print than a fingerprint? Yes, areas that our hands would wrap around. Sometimes our fingers don't touch the end of the, the item and we're like, more likely to find a, a palm on it, such as if we're pushing a vehicle down the road, we might push our hands on the, on the back of the bonnet. Or Our rice's palm is the area which is found down the side of our palm here, which is quite common from when we're putting our hand down and writing letters or writing checks. Place the powder on here, start to develop up the ridges of your palm. Quite different to the fingerprint, isn't it, in terms of the structure there? Yes, they are. The palm we break up into three areas. One is the interdigital area, which is the area underneath our fingers. The thena area, which is uh, where our thumb is. And opposite that, we have the hypothena area. So how often would you use a palm print in the case? Currently, we have about 25 to 30% of our daily workload would involve palm print identifications. In this case, the body had been in the water for many hours, so working with the small piece of skin was going to be a challenge. The easiest method was to remove the piece of skin and then photograph it flat. We shine a torch at an angle and that highlights the ridges in the skin. And then we take this in black and white because we find the contrast is easier to see the ridges and the ridge detail. Through this process, officers were able to get a partial palm print. Not enough to get a match through the national database, but it still could prove to be key. This investigation attracted a large media presence because of the macabre nature of the fact that the limbs were missing. That actually helped us because it got that message out to a wider audience in New Zealand. The police ran a hotline, and within a day of releasing information, a concerned woman came forward and identified the victim as Tony Stanlake. She was obviously very close with Tony. They would have regular communication. She didn't live in Wellington, so it wasn't like she was around there every day, but they would certainly talk quite regularly on the telephone and, and send messages to one another. She had been unable to talk or reach Tony for two or three days, which was highly unusual. When the media was released around the belt and the description of the body, she had that sinking feeling and knew, oh my gosh, that must be Tony, and immediately contacted our inquiry team to say, hey, look, you know, I haven't seen my partner now for three days and he fits the description that you're, you're asking for. The fingerprints team researched their records. We obtained the hard copy of the fingerprint and palm print form and we did a manual check. We looked at the photograph on the piece of skin and compared it against the palm print form. And once I'd established that there was sufficient characteristics in agreement, I was then able to say that, that an identification had been made against Tony Stanley. A day after his handless body is discovered, police have made a formal identification. Once we established Tony Stanlake's identity and that he was the victim, we went and looked through his house to see if we could find any connections to a person who might have killed him and any information about his movements uh, prior to him being killed. By checking bank and phone records, police were able to locate CCTV footage of the 62-year-old victim on the last day he was seen alive. So Tony, for all intents and purposes, to everybody, was a upstanding, normal member of our society. He had previously been a fireman, due to a back injury, had retired, and he was uh, a creature of habit, like a lot of us are. He would regularly go and buy coffee from the local cafe, sit down and do the crossword in the paper, and lived a very routine, normal lifestyle. The police were thinking that maybe he'd been killed at his house, so we were going to see whether it looked as if something might have happened. And due to the nature and number of injuries, wherever the murder happened, there would be a lot of blood. There was no suggestion that any sort of bloodletting type assault had occurred. But investigators did find something they weren't expecting. 
sections of the house interior were set up as cannabis grow rooms. Now, investigators had another element to consider. Was the cannabis linked to the murder? Several lines of inquiry were now underway. I was receiving phone data on a daily basis, large volumes of data. So you have all of these numbers in there. You're going, well, whose number's that? Whose number's that? You know, who are they talking to? Once you put that together in its entirety, a picture begins to emerge as to who Tony was communicating with perhaps on a daily or, you know, or at least regular basis. So as we worked through, it became quite apparent that a person of interest to our inquiry, in fact, was in communication with Tony very regularly. In fact, he was second only to Tony's partner at that point, if you were to statistically analyse the um, complete records. The person of interest uncovered from phone records was Daniel Moore, a 21-year-old unemployed man. We were able to establish that Daniel Moore and Tony Stanlake had got together to form a commercial cannabis growing enterprise. Tony Stanlake had a lot of knowledge in how to do this, and Daniel Moore was the person who was going to be the hands-on making it happen. It wasn't, I suppose, friendly or matey type texts. They were always very matter-of-fact and, uh, you know, just to do with around, you know, how's the, how's, the, how's the growing working out, you know, I'm coming around to check on the plants, those type of messages. And it was the last group of messages that were of particular interest. Daniel had texted Tony to say, are you still coming over tonight? Tony replied, yes, I'll be there at 7. And then just prior to 7pm, Daniel had texted Tony saying, shall I put the jug on? And Tony replied, yes, please. A, it confirmed a meeting had been organised, and by Tony responding to, yes, please put the jug on, we knew that the meeting was going ahead because he was obviously on his way, um, you know, put the jug on, I'll be there shortly sort of thing. And then Tony's phones stopped. You know, there was no outgoing, either, whether it be texting or uh, telephone calls, going out of his phone. Once we established the connection of Daniel Moore to Tony Stanlake, we had a look at his background and what the police knew about him through our intelligence information. Daniel Moore had a criminal record, matched witness descriptions of the man stuck on the beach and was the registered owner of a blue Subaru. And that provided enough interest for us to actually put a, uh, a plan together the next day to start following him. Three days after the murder victim is discovered, police are covertly on the tail of their prime suspect. He's on the move and he's towing a trailer. He went from his family address and then went to another house in Miramar. At that address, uh, a lot of items were loaded into the trailer uh, and then it was driven to the Happy Valley tip, which was very interesting. After he left the Happy Valley tip, naturally we swooped in and had a look and said what was left behind. We kept following him to other places that day where he dropped off a large amount of hydroponics and cannabis cultivation equipment. He then went and visited a number of people in the Hutt Valley and then went out to an address in Wainui Amata. While he was at that address, our officers were able to get a look down a back driveway and they saw the Sabaru vehicle we were intensely interested in. And that was a huge moment for the investigation. You get some days during the investigations you never ever forget, and I don't think anyone working that day will ever forget it. It was fast. We started detailing staff to go out to all of the places that he'd been that day, and we contained all of those as crime scenes and started having crime scene examinations at each place and started locating lots of interesting items. At a crime scene, you get one chance to to collect the evidence at that scene. So you tend to collect as much as you can and then down the track uh, a decision will be made which ones we're going to send to ESR. Because you only get one chance at the crime scene, you've got to make sure you don't not collect something because you're not going to be able to go back and get it. 
We were sending people left, right and centre, trying to actually contain scenes, trying to keep out of the way so they're not seen by Daniel Moore, but also obtain information, feed it back to the base. It was just a mass of people with information going every which way that day. Moving fast before anything was lost or destroyed, it was immediately apparent that Moore had been disposing of crucial evidence. There was a considerable amount of blood on the items, and if you put them all together in a room, there would be a lot of blood staining. At that stage, we'd made a decision to speak to him, and so he was stopped in Taranaki Street. He was detained and arrested. Once Daniel Moore had been interviewed at the station and his lawyer was here giving him advice, the senior members of the team gathered together and we evaluated and assessed the information that we had at that time. We also spoke to the Crown Prosecutor and we made a decision to charge Daniel Moore with murder. A warrant was issued to search Daniel Moore's house. It was three days since the body had been discovered. Would there be any evidence of where the murder had taken place? It was a very interesting picture. It was at a house, it was a very upmarket house. It was big, it was spacious. There were a number of young people living there that didn't have a lot of income. There was a strong, distinctive smell of cannabis. As soon as you walked into the dress, you could detect that. As soon as you've walked into the garage, it's evident that the, the room has been used as a grow room. You could see there was hooks in the ceiling, which indicated there were grow lights had been hung from the hooks and chains. The garage door had been sealed up to stop the smell of cannabis leaking out. There were red spray can paint stains on the floor, which looked as if they were over other stains. I actually managed to use a scalpel and sort of scrape through the paint and get a positive result for blood under it. So it did suggest that somebody tried to cover it up. There were bags of rubbish and rolls of carpet out in another garden, which seemed slightly odd. Not far from the back door of the address was a Shimonera fireplace. There was evidence that a recent fire had taken place. The suggestion that the hands that had been cut off the deceased were not found anywhere at the beach. So there was the thinking that somewhere along the line, stuff must have been got rid of. The ash and remains from the potbelly stove were examined further. We emptied out all the contents, but also picked out solid identifiable bits of the burnt debris. They looked like bits of a cell phone and a battery. Could this be the victim's phone? The task of recovering anything from the burnt debris was given to document examiner Delwyn Walsh. We were looking at it as a physical exhibit. This is the actual phone here, is it? Yeah, so that's the biggest piece that we had. And we could tell straight away what we were dealing with. But most of the pieces are broken and fragmented, and some of them are absolutely tiny. We could see some things were still attached that looked like they might be chips. This is a picture of one of them. Gosh, so it just looks like a sort of ashy square, something that's charred. The hope was that some kind of identifying information might still remain. But first, it had to be carefully cleaned. We've used cotton buds to pick up the ash and remove it. And because of the way the characters are formed on the chip, we can actually see some text there. And you can very clearly see there That's a right. serial number. Yeah, it's identifying data. So what I did next was actually contact those chip manufacturers. They were able to say that they had been sent to Samsung in Korea. And they were also able to say, based on that chip data, that they were going to be used on the CDMA network. How do you link that to a specific phone? At that point, there were only 13 Samsung phones which had been sold in New Zealand for use on the CDMA network. By comparing all of our fragments to each of those, there was only one model of Samsung phone that this could have been. 
and that was a Samsung 361 and that was the model of the victim's phone. This detailed work provided investigators with another piece to the puzzle and the pieces were falling into place. Lab results had confirmed blood on the tarpaulin found at the beach was that of Tony Stanlake. Police had evidence of Moore purchasing a tarpaulin the day of the murder. Its packaging was found in the rubbish at his house. ESR now had results on the blood from the beach. The two blood samples matched the DNA profile of the deceased person, Mr Stanlake. As well as results from the three cigarette butts. They got one unidentified male from a cigarette butt, one un unidentified female from another cigarette butt, and the third cigarette butt matched a Mr Daniel Moore. The forensic evidence located at Red Rocks was crucial. The cigarette butt had Daniel Moore's DNA on it. That's the same location as the Subaru was observed by the local residents. And then at that place where the drag marks were into the water, there were blood spots where the DNA identified Tony Stanlake. So that put Moore, the car, and Stanlake all at that particular scene. And that was a very crucial piece of evidence to show that he had been there and disposed of the body. Daniel had him on the tarpaulins and dragged him down to the water's edge and I guess got him out into the water as far as he could. Thought, OK, job's done. Gone back to his vehicle and realised, oh, heck, I'm stuck. Uh, and now I've got a problem. It's dark, it's cold. You know, the natural thing to do if you're a smoker is probably stand there next to your car, have a couple of durries while you're trying to work out how the hell am I going to get my car out of here while I've got a body floating in the ocean next to me. He would have been the only person down there had it not been for our people coming from their batches to watch the All Blacks test match in town. There was mounting evidence to say Daniel Moore had disposed of the body, but could they prove he was the killer? The grow room in Moore's house became a focus for investigators. The area had been cleaned and its contents dismantled and disposed of. But traces of blood had been identified under the red paint. Could investigators retrieve any further evidence? And what tale would this room tell? The focus then becomes to work out what was that uh, garage like at the time? What was there and where is it now? And how are we going to put it back and reconstruct what's happened? We'd recovered an awful lot of bits of wood and equipment from the tip. Uh, we took all that and we laid it all out and then started reassembling it and putting it back together. We could match up nail holes, we could match up other forensic evidence in terms of paint and bits and pieces. And that we then created what we believe is a, a, a good reconstruction of actually what the physical scene of that garage was at the time. We noticed that when we were doing the examination of the skirting, we could see where a cupboard had been because it was a clear patch of dust and you could see that something had been moved. We measured that and then we measured the cabinet that was in the garage. They matched exactly. And when we opened up the two doors of that, we found that there was a lot of blood spatter on the inside, the bottom shelf and below. So it's actually the very bottom level of the cupboard. So it looked, looked like it had happened somewhere near this cupboard, in front of this cupboard. Chemicals in the luminol reagent that we use, they react with haemoglobin, which is found in blood. And there's a chemical reaction, and one of the products of that reaction is a very small amount of energy in the form of light, and that's why the blood will glow. So you're doing it in the dark, so you, you basically do a fine spray across this wall, and it, bits of it start to glow, and you can actually sort of see lines between the garage door and the master bedroom, there was quite a big wall, and I found quite a lot of tiny, tiny specks of blood on it. And it was only when we luminoled that we found out that that whole wall had been wiped, and we could see the white marks. Basically, if you've got a dry blood stain on something, you get a wet cloth, all you're doing is dissolving it and smearing it around. 
and that's what the luminol shows. You can't see it anymore, but it is actually still there. The strongest luminol reactions were in the garage and showed evidence of blood pooling close to the cupboard. The luminol suggests that maybe he was left bleeding up near that corner by the bench because that's where we got the biggest reaction and that seemed like a good candidate for where that cupboard had originally been. There was a long, what looked like a drag mark, so basically you're getting a long positive line of reaction consistent with something with traces of blood on it being dragged along. Potentially the body, I assume, would have been wrapped um, and there was a small, obviously small amounts of, of blood and uh, body fluid that had leaked out. That trial went down the hallway, out into the entranceway, down the steps, along the front path and ended on the driveway, which is where Mr Moore used to park his vehicle. Police know after leaving the house, he drove to Red Rocks Beach to dump the body. CCTV footage captures Daniel taking his car through a car wash 25 minutes after witnesses have helped him off the beach. This is about how long it would take to drive from Red Rocks to the car wash. Moore's vehicle was seized. Would there be any links in Moore's car to the grisly murder? Forensic scientist Janina Neal carefully examined the interior. Mainly I was interested in determining if there are any visible bloodstains in the car. We initially looked at it just with very bright lights to see if there are any stains that actually look like blood. What did you find? So we found several areas of visible blood staining in the vehicle, mainly in the back of the vehicle, as you can see here. So we carried out luminal testing all through the car, in the front, in the back, and in the boot of the vehicle. And what did you discover using the luminal? The majority of the back seat actually reacted with luminol. So almost the whole of the back seat gave this reaction. Apart from one particular area in the middle of the seat, you can see here, this is what we called a void area, or an actual area of negative reaction. So there was no reaction in this particular area. And of what was of interest was that um, it had a, this area had a particular shape. And you can see I've drawn around it here, and it has the, to me, it had the shape of an ax. That really is a very distinctive ax shape, isn't it? Definitely. So what did that suggest to you? So what that implies is that there may have been object, such as an axe, placed on the seat. If a subsequent object, such as Mr Stanlake's body, if it was, say, wrapped in a tarpaulin, if there were traces of blood on the outside of that tarpaulin, they would have transferred to the seat, apart from the area that was protected, you know, that was underneath this axe. An axe was among the many recovered items Moore had disposed of. So the axe was brought here to be examined urgently. And the examination of that showed there were blood stains on the handle of the axe, which we sampled, and that blood was shown to come from Mr Stanley. The head of the axe, because there was a possibility it had been used to chop off hands or been used on the neck of the deceased, it was examined pretty extensively for blood stains, but I found no traces of blood on the head of that axe, and that included in going into the area where the head of the axe joined the handle to try and see if there had been clean up, if there'd been any residue left there caught in that area. But no, no blood was found on the head of that axe. What were the weapons of murder and where could they be found? The case against Daniel Moore is rapidly growing. Odd pieces of information discovered at the victim's house are now making sense. The absence of evidence is not always the evidence of absence. In this case, what we didn't find was actually very, very important. Tony's partner had told us that whenever they went out together, Tony would always go into his bedroom and take cash from his bedside drawer. We didn't find a lot of money, a lot of cash, and Tony was a person who did everything in cash, everything in $20 bills, all the money gone. The keys to his car are also gone, but the car's still parked in the drive. So if he had driven over to Daniel Moore's address to check the cannabis, how did it get back? 
when the vehicle was examined, the windscreen wipers were on the most powerful setting, which for us spoke volumes about, well, clearly the car's been used on a, a rainy day, a very heavy rainy day. As it was the night Tony was killed. Police suspected Moore had returned the car after committing the brutal murder. When we looked at the cell phone records, we could actually trace calls and text messages that Daniel made on the journey in Tony's car from his address back to Crory and see which cell towers he pinged through as he made that journey. When he arrived in Karori, he has committed a burglary at the address. He'd gone in, removed an unknown quantity of cash. We think it was probably quite a large amount of cash. He has the cash, but no way of getting home. And at this point, he's also run out of phone credit. We had a witness at the local fish and chip shop that could remember a young Māori male come into his fish and chip shop and asked to use the telephone. What was really unique about that encounter was, firstly, Daniel was very wet from the rain, and secondly, Daniel had said, I need to use your telephone to call a cab, and he pulled out a $100 note and said, look, I'll give you $100 to use your telephone, please. And the owner was, of course, quite shocked and was like, oh, no, you can just use my phone. You're only ringing a cab. Don't worry about it. From there, obviously, we were able to identify the cab company from the phone records. From that, they were able to identify the taxi and its route to Daniel Moore's home. Verified with CCTV footage of him stopping on the way to purchase more credit for his phone. CCTV footage also reveals what Moore did preceding the murder, especially in the hours before his final meeting with Tony Stanlake. So the day of the murder, Daniel had bought several items, including a mallet and an axe and secateurs and other items. Once we'd established that, we asked the forensic pathologist, Dr Simon Stables, to come back to Wellington and conduct a final examination and start to compare the items that we'd identified Daniel as buying as to perhaps having real relevance to forensic evidence on the body. Did you get an insight into how many different tools or what he'd used to kill the victim? I think that there's been multiple uh, weapons used here, at least two, possibly three. We have a cut to the neck, that's something sharp, potentially a knife. A scalpel was collected as evidence, but no traces could be found to link it to the victim. Then we have the injuries to the wrists, where we have definite chop marks on the right wrist and a very clean chop on the left. So that would say, uh, another sharp implement, something with a little bit heavier, so that would be consistent with a meat cleaver. A meat cleaver was also collected, but again, no victim's DNA. The blows to the head, the size of the fractures and the splits to the skin uh, would be consistent with a mallet. A mallet was also recovered. Dr Stables compared measurements from the mallet's head to injuries on the victim's skull, and the results were telling. The measurements of some of the head injuries to Tony distinctly matched the uh, dimensions of the mallet that Daniel had bought. On the top of the head of the mallet, there were visible small stains of blood, and quite numerous, which were what we call spatter or impact spatter stains. And those stains occur when there's some force applied to liquid blood to distribute it in small stains. The same kind of blood patterning that was found in the bottom of the cupboard. I was asked to sample the handle of the mallet. So there was a trace of DNA found, but didn't produce a DNA profile. We took samples from the, uh, of blood from the face of the mallet and the top of the mallet. Um, and both of those samples, the blood, uh, was sent for DNA testing and came back that the uh, DNA could be from Mr Stanlake. The mallet had been purchased by Moore the very morning of the murder. It showed premeditation. This was before Tony was brutally murdered. So it proved that Daniel Moore had been planning this. But why? Why was he planning to murder? Daniel Moore figured out after a while that he didn't need Tony Stanlake. He could do this all himself and he'd have more profit. So greed took over and we believe that is the motive of why Moore killed 
Stan Lake. Once Daniel Moore decided to murder Tony Stanlake, he started planning. He started purchasing the items that he would need and use in the murder. He arranged for Tony to come round at a time that was suitable for him to do the killing. That night of the 6th, Daniel had texted everyone to say, no one's to come around, the old man's gonna be here, you know, you can't come home until I say, it's okay to come home. They've gone out into the cannabis cultivating room and Tony Stanlake wouldn't have seen it for a while. He's very interested in it. He would have been in front. Daniel Moore would have let him go in front. Daniel Moore was behind him with the mallet. Once Tony's fallen to the floor, he's then hit him a number of times with the mallet. Mr Stanlake was on the ground close to that cabinet when he's been struck in the back of the head, causing that blood to spatter across the garage and into the, the base of that cabinet. It may have been then that the offender had assumed he had passed away. And then sometime later, he showed signs, in fact, he was still alive. And that's when he then came back and then uh, inflicted the other injuries to the, to the neck. Dr Stables confirmed the hands had been removed sometime after death. Where is not known, and the hands have never been found. Daniel Moore left the body at the address for a couple of days. It's quite unusual and probably reflects his overconfident personality. And it certainly appeared he was confident he would never be caught for this murder. During the days, Tony Stanlake's body was left lying in the garage. Witness accounts have Daniel out spending a lot of cash. Cash that police suspect he stole from Stanlake. Daniel was doing a lot of shopping, a lot of entertaining. Every time he'd go out with a group of friends clubbing, he would be paying for all the drinks and using $20 bills. He was flashing a lot of cash around and texting everyone about it. One of the texts he sent to a friend was, De Popo don't know nada. Well, that didn't prove to be true. It turned out the police did know. Within four days of finding the body, they had the killer and a very strong case. The case was heard in the Wellington High Court and at the end of the day, a jury convicted Daniel Moore of the murder of Tony Stanlake. Daniel Moore was sentenced to life in prison with a non-parole period of 18 years. One of the things which highlighted for me was finding that very small piece of palm on the wrist, and that was sufficient to get an identification on this gentleman. So even though the hands are missing, he was actually still identifiable by his hands. It was a really interesting case to work on, everything from becoming quite close with parts of Tony's family and, you know, um, helping them in the journey that they had to, to face working through this, but also the different forensic elements. Obviously, the phone data aspect of the case was very, very large. This case was not solved by one phase. It was solved by a number, including technology, forensics, the community provided excellent support all of those put together was what actually resolved this in the end, and it was the sum of all parts. Pathology and fingerprints officers did outstanding work in identifying Tony Stanlake, enabling the investigation to move swiftly before the killer could cover his tracks and get away with murder. Murder.